I'm going to show you how I actually solo, so I'm just going to play a raw idea up front, and then I'm going to show you guys how I actually create like solo tracks over that, and how I uh, get my ideas just from soloing. I don't usually write within MIDI to begin with, I usually just save the performance. So it's a completely different way of writing. So this is what I got so far. So that's the original. That's the original. I'm going to show you. I already picked my sound out and how I want to do this. So it's just a synth lead. Just a saw tooth lead. Nothing special. a quick demo I'm not even gonna really save it I so that's just an idea of what you can do and that's just playing pretty much basic arpeggios but I'm gonna show you how I actually um, do that and the actual theory behind how I think so I'm gonna save this other performance that was just kind of a demo getting out an idea of what I wanted to play so now we're gonna do notes and automation I'm whatever I'll show you guys on the screen later so so we want to do one actually before I do that, one, two, three, four. <laughs> So that is just kind of in a very, very rough draft. So if we want to do one tick, um, I want to add one more note here and add it. I'm just going to quantize everything and then I'll deal with that later. is lining things up because when you hit quick quantize all it it just puts it to the nearest measure but it might not necessarily be correct <laughs> See, like this one goes right here you want this I actually want this one. Alright, so what is going on here musically? That's always a big question. So, this is just an arpeggio on a D major chord. If you don't know what your majors and minor chords are, I'll have I'll uh, try to get a a link of um, I'll I'll put a I'll post a picture of it. But all it is is your arpeggio and your chord. That's all this is, is the fourth. So it goes from D to D sus. All it is is your D sus chord. So instead of having one, three, five, uh, one, three, five like a normal chord, you're going to have a D sus, which is a one, four, five. It just has a raised third to the next scale tone. For example, the third is F. F is your third, your 
leading tone is going to be your fifth, which is your G in the fifth. So you have that roll. So, so, so instead of arpeggiating something like this, you have that middle note. So. It's just a walk down of the scale now. Walk down of the scale. So the scale is the pentatonic. But basically it doesn't have a second or a seventh. So it's just a natural, not a uh, seventh tone. So it has, it has, it's a five note scale and not a seven note scale. This is the walk down. See how all the notes are just rolling down the scale. So instead of rolling down the scale, I added a little blues lick. I add these blues licks in. So it's not just cut and dry. There's more to it than just playing arpeggios. And that's one thing that a lot of newer musicians write is you're playing, oh, all I can think of are arpeggios, this, and you're in this little tiny box because you're so focused on how to play, make things that are even passable when there's so much more embellishments you can add. So mine's adding a bunch of different embellishments throughout just normal playing keys or playing uh, arpeggios. <laughs> happens in this measure is very interesting this measure 8 right here is um, in measure 8 this actually works as well as part of a transition between the two different dominant keys that are going on So you're, it's really just the same thing. It's just arpeggiating the chords and then understanding the motion of the song. If you're going, if the songs, if the chords in this, let's play just the chords now. Um, get that out and the bass out. See, this is this chord right here. Um, Wrong patch. This chord right here. This chord right here, this F A seven C eight. If I can find it, remember I have the camera in between me and that. Remember that I have the camera in between me and the keyboard, so it's kinda hard for me to This is a fifth, so it goes five, five, one. So it ends the phrase. It's just understanding the motions of the chords and how in single notes because even if I play on the uh, chord, even with this, not that sound, uh, this one, I have to label them. I just wrote this today. And what I'm doing is pretty much accenting the one. I'm accenting just the one note, so or the fur or the uh, root note or the tonic, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> G, here's our G. And it's 
So not only are we accenting our roots, but we're also accenting our fifths, which is this note right here, the A. Here's our A. So even if you wanted to, if you had no musical experience, all you can do is hit root and A and just change the order of it or the frequency of how often you do it and you can literally just solo over this whole song. <laughs> just on the root in A. That's all it is. You can write an entire melody off of two notes if you really wanted to. It doesn't have all the embellishments and it sounds kind of flat, but it's a good place to start. If Just point out your roots and fifths. So if we go... it's complicated as well but so all we're doing is in root and five all we're doing is literally just changing the order of root and five All that that solo is, is alterations of root and five. Then you can add all your embellishments because they fit in between. Your root and five are your primary tones of a chord. Your third is gets very interesting because you're trying to... Your third is what's called the color tone. It dictates the shape of the chord, either it's major or minor. So it's when you're soloing and you're adding embellishments, you have to be aware of where your thirds are. So this note right here, this upper note, this upper note, and this bottom note. So bottom note, bottom note, bottom, upper note here, bottom, bottom. It's always the inside note. Just, yeah, it's up, it's this upper one here, bottom one here, uh, upper one here, bottom one here, and just because they're a bunch of inversions. But the goal is to be aware of that and focus on not overcomplicating your color tone. So in this particular clip, we're going to watch that. Now, how many times does this trigger in this first opening two bars? <laughs> basically signifies the direction of what you're trying to play. So if we go... So because I hit it and I go 5-3, five, 5... It stops the gap. It stops the gap from being so dramatic. So it's not 5-1. We can do 5-1 all day long, but it, also, it bridges the gap, so it's not super far. So we can go... We can do either 5-1 or 5-3-1. So here, take, take a look at this. Sounds okay. See, if we go 5-3-1-1-3-1, it ends the phrase a little bit differently, so it's not as so static. So we go. That's 5-1, only at 5-1, and then I'm just going to add the third note. And you tell me which one sounds more fulfilling and not necessarily as dry and static. Now, let's add my embellishments are adding all the minor seconds and connecting all the phrases together. So they're different, there's so many different ways 
to just connect phrases together that it literally can just be a long book in itself. <laughs> See, all the connections are different ways, but they have to be in context with the motion of the song. This is why context is so important with it. Context meaning the distance in the way that the chords are working. It's not here. This isn't going down. So the melody has to be going down as well. It can't just be going high. If I say, if I make a melody that's only going to be high, it's going to sound like this. The motion doesn't complement the chords. It's all about complementing each other. The melody complements the harmony, the harmony should complement the melody. And they work together in unison and conjunction with each other. Mm -hmm. 